I expected to die when I snuck into Iraq. I took like $10,000 in cash and I flew to Jordan and I just negotiated to get someone to smuggle me in to Iraq because uh, I had at that point worked in many war zones, Rwanda during the genocide, a really vicious war in Congo, in Bosnia. And all I heard about on the news was about bombs and guns. I think that we just can't understand what war means to children when you're listening on the news to sort of secondhand summaries. They died with their arms around each other on their bed as my country was bombing them. Wow, that, that gives one just the tiniest insight into what a hellacious experience all those children in Gaza are going through now. Welcome to the Big Picture Podcast. My name is Mohammed Hassan, and today we speak with Dr. Les Roberts. He's an epidemiologist and professor emeritus at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health and spent his career documenting death and disease in conflict zones, including in Rwanda, the Congo, and Iraq. In 2004, he published a highly controversial report into the US invasion of Iraq after smuggling himself across the border in. That report said that more than 100,000 civilians had been killed, mostly by US coalition airstrikes. That report was rubbished and ignored by US officials, including then President George W. Bush. But just two years later, Les Roberts and his team revised the figure, saying it was closer to 600,000. In March, he wrote for Time magazine about the war in Gaza, defending the accuracy of the death toll released by Gaza's health ministry which has been attacked by Israel's government, several media outlets, as well as US President Joe Biden. As it stands today, more than 36,000 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces since October 7th, including more than 15,000 children. That number, by most accounts, is conservative because it doesn't include thousands of people missing or trapped under the rubble of their homes, nor those who have died from the spread of disease and famine. Despite statements by Israel's government that it's letting in aid, UN humanitarian chief Martin Griffiths says it's become almost impossible to deliver aid to those who need it in Gaza. Since the invasion of Rafah in May, the crossing into Egypt has remained closed with more than 2,008 trucks stuck behind it. So what is the real death toll in Gaza? And is that even the right question to ask? Dr. Les Roberts, uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome to The Big Picture. Hi, Mohammed. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So I want to begin by asking you to speak to a piece that you wrote back in March in Time magazine, looking and examining the way that the death toll in Gaza was being collected and was being reported. Now, at that time, you said that it is very likely that the figures that we have been seeing, which are up to 36,000 now, are conservative. Is this something that you still believe in? And why do you believe that? Yes. So interestingly, Time magazine reached out and asked me to do this because a reporter that had accompanied me when I was doing a survey in Congo 20 years ago asked me to critique this, this pretty harsh criticism of the Hamas government. And the criticism was completely unfounded, just completely unfounded. And as I wrote in the piece, in the first three months of this conflict, like through December, the Ministry of Health more or less was still functioning. It had many functioning hospitals. A lot of its staff were still operating per usual. And there were two really great outside evaluations that showed, oh my gosh, these numbers are real. There is overwhelming evidence that they weren't faked. For, for example, a trivial example is uh, the London School of Hygiene took data from a bunch of different hospitals and a bunch and three morgues, I think it was, that was in October going to the Ministry of Health. So this was information from hospitals before the Ministries of Health had touched it. And uh, they looked at the registration number with the government, like your, your ID in Gaza, which is given to you as a child and has started since 1960. And the numbers have gone up steadily since the, the numbering system began. And they compared it to the age. And it turns out there had been two periods 
over that half century when the Gaza government had a catch-up period, had said, hey, anyone who missed this, anyone who's moved here in the last 12 years, please feel free to register for a government ID number. Mm -hmm. And so when they plotted the original data coming from hospitals of the number against age, there were like two zones where there were many people having very, of different ages having similar ID numbers. And those were exactly matching the two periods over the last half century where the government had had catch-ups. And so the London School of Hygiene, for example, concluded, nah, this just can't be fabricated if eight different hospitals and three morgues are producing data with this incredibly trivial consistency built into them. That was one example. There are several examples like this that the group from Johns Hopkins and the group from the London School of Hygiene uh, critiqued in the or analyzed when they published in the journal The Lancet in December. So I can say through December, this was probably the most rigorous government death toll I've ever seen while a war was going on. And we had 20 something deaths through December. My understanding from friends who have friends working in Gaza in the Ministry of Health and from uh, talks I've had heard, things I've read, is that the system has really fallen apart a lot since the 1st of January. And falling apart could mean two things. It could mean possibly, for example, because starting just a couple months ago, the Hamas Ministry of Health has been using press reports as part of their inputs on how many people have died in a given week. And th the possibility of double counting exists with such press reports when it's not someone in a morgue having the, the person's government ID put on a death certificate and their name and, and the exact details. So that's a possibility. But a possibility that's a hundred times higher is that deaths are not ever getting to a morgue and are just being buried or left under rubble or are coming in as someone dead and a facility is completely overwhelmed. And they're just saying, I had a female, she's very little, maybe two years old. I'm writing it down on my list and they're gonna get buried because we have no burial facilities here or, or we have no processing facilities here. So all that to say, the chances are we've had some undercounting since the, the sort of reduction in function of the Ministry of Health starting in a big way in January. It was very solid through January for someone to pretend that there weren't 20 something thousand deaths in, through December would be just like laughing in the face of science. Since then, by all accounts, things have gotten less precise and less complete. And from my understanding, a big part of that and, and you know you you mentioned the 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 kind of the collapse of a lot of the 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 health infrastructure that was used to count uh the the death toll the morgues the hospitals um a lot of the main primary hospitals that were the center points of this in Gaza are no longer functioning al shifa hospital being a, a a key example of it um what does this mean then for the day-to-day -day, uh, ability for doctors and health professionals in Gaza to be able to uh, uh, not only, I mean, obviously deal with the, the, the injured and the, and the dead, but also to be able to capture an accurate picture of what's happening on the ground. Well, of course, suddenly the incentive to get bodies to the hospital has gone down. The hospitals, by all accounts in the northern half of the country, are, are largely like e either not functioning or functioning at a small portion of their capacity before. So like suddenly that the whole incentive in the system to bring bodies to hospitals has gone down. And so, of course, of course, our count counting is getting worse. Like, it just has to be. And when it comes to the day-to-day uh, -day death uh, toll, there is so much politicization in a conflict like this when it comes to how many people are dying, where they're dying, what the correlation is to the actions of the Israeli military. Is there any way of being able to gaze through the fog of politics and be able to understand what the reality is? The Gaza Ministry of Health is in a difficult spot as their system 
starts functioning less and less. They probably are undercounting, but if they do anything to up their numbers, that might find one or two examples of, of double counting, then their credibility goes way down. Uh, this is a slight tangent, but I was involved in a couple of studies in Iraq, estimating the death toll there. And the first study published in the Lancet in 2004, we came out with an estimate that at least 100,000 had died for a variety of reasons. For example, that bombs kill in, plus, in clusters. And we went and sampled houses in clusters, not understanding in 2004 that bombs were the main mechanism of death. For an, a couple of reasons, we ended up with a really imprecise estimate. And so we erred on the low side. Mm. And the couple of surveys that were done after had an estimate you know, higher, like 120,000 dead in that period that we had looked at. So we erred on the low side, knowing that it probably was over 100,000, but our estimate was so imprecise, it just seemed like the safe thing to do. And my guess is that Gaza is bending over backwards to make sure they don't have some invalidities or repetitions in their data, which would then just fuel their critics. I, I don't know that. I have not worked in Gaza, but I am strongly speculating that. So they've got this trade-off. A, they want the world to know and the, uh, they want the world to feel the pain. And death tolls are an exceptionally universal way of inducing uh, compassion around the world. So on one hand, they want people to know just how many people have died. But on the other hand, they don't want their critics, of which they are numerous and vicious, they don't want them saying, oh, look, they're fabricating data because I found this same body over here and they actually had it with a name and a death certificate over here and double counted it. So, uh, yeah, this is this is a really impossible spot for the Ministry of Health to be in. Other ministries of health have been here before and uh, there is a tendency, and I have done it myself, to err on the side of being low when your critics are especially vicious. And I do want to um, talk to you about your experience in Iraq because I think it's really important. Um, one of the things in Gaza specifically, I think, that is is often talked about is, is that there's a distinction between the deaths that have been confirmed. And, and you know, you mentioned the ID system, for example, that the Ministry of Health has, and then the number of, uh, of people that are missing. Um, there are you know, more than 10,000 people reported missing, and then there is uh, an, a, an unmeasurable uh, number of people that could be buried under rubble. Um, there's also a number of people that are, I think, you know, from a lot of estimates are going to increase over the next couple of months because of the impacts of starvation, because of the impacts of an expected famine, especially in northern Gaza. What are the conditions, what are the other kind of unknowns in from your perspective that will contribute to to a you know a, a true death toll in Gaza and is there any way of being able to predict or estimate what that is? There isn't a precise and a certain way. Let's put it that way. As you said, there are multiple things now at play. I saw recently there was a a report I think released this week uh, trying to predict if there was an all out attack on Rafa, how many would die and it gets really complicated. If you compare what happened in Gaza City with Rafa today, you didn't have widespread malnourished children. You had people who were more capable of physically fleeing than they are today. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, have, you just had a completely more physically robust society in October than we have now. And so these predictions are very, very difficult. <clears throat> but on the other hand, now when you've had eight months of patterns happening, there probably are things that are going to happen again and again. And along those lines, I, I, I want to get back to your, your opening comment. About three weeks ago, the United Nations OCHA did an analysis of the deaths in Gaza for which there was complete information. That is that a, a death certificate had been filled out and the cause of death was known and the name and so on. And of the 
at that point, estimated 36,000 deaths that had occurred. There were about two thirds of them had this complete information, very disproportionately from the first three months of the war or so. And there were then about a third that were missing. And a couple of really, I believe, misguided articles were written saying, wow, look, the United Nations is downing their death toll. Mm -hmm. And wow, look, the United Nations that used to say it was mostly women and children who were killed now think it was almost half of all the deaths were adult males. And we saw this in Syria. And we saw this in Iraq that deaths happen in non-random ways in times of war. And we saw like clockwork in Syria, and it was very well documented in the non-government controlled areas where men would disproportionately be killed on the front lines, you know, outside of Aleppo or outside of whatever town they were in. And they would very disproportionately be killed by gunshots. Women and children were very disproportionately killed inside towns, not out at the fronts, and very disproportionately killed by explosives. So when you sort of went into the data, it it sort of looked like, oh, bombs are targeting women and children, but it just was sort of different dynamics at different points of space with the combatants using different weapons on the front line versus what they used to uh, demoralize or attack the people on the interior of Aleppo or some other city under siege. And we're seeing that in Gaza today. And in this data that the UN looked at, yes, it was very disproportionately males that we had complete information for. And it turns out it's disproportionately males who are dying of gunshot wounds. And it, it completely makes sense. If you think about how these big city battles and sieges have been taking place, often there's a period of bombing that happens in the interior. And then the bombing stops when Israel intends to send its own troops onto the ground. And when it sends its own troops into an area, it stops bombing in that area. And thus, most of, most of the violent deaths that start happening are happening with gunshots. And so I saw a critique criticizing the Ministry of Health data because certain days it's mostly women and children dying and certain days it's more men dying. Like this was what a critic was saying was evidence there was fake data. No, 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 that's not fake data. That's, that's the cycles of combat that are happening in city siege situations like this. And in the same way, adult males, gunshot wounds, were more likely to have people taken to morgues and hospitals, thus more likely to be complete. So when the UN comes out with this, this uh, reassessment of complete data three weeks ago, it looks like a higher fraction are males than they were saying before, but no, 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 that's, that's not wrong. There's a bias within the system towards not having complete death certificates for women and children who are dying under rubble. Maybe even like the family was there with them. They they know their loved one is buried in that building, but they, they don't even have a body. And therefore, you know, you have incomplete data in, in the data set. So we're in a funky spot. Data are never, uh, I don't know what the word is, random or simple or even in Iraq, gunshot wounds were very disproportionately adult males. Little mm -hmm. children very disproportionately died from bombs. Like we don't have even experiences within war zones and for outside critics to be sort of attacking the sources and saying they're not plausible because there's weird patterns is really, really unwise. And we had, uh, uh, you know, a transition where um, even the health ministry itself has admitted that it is no longer able to accurately um, tally the the daily death toll in the way that it has before. And a big, a big part of this is because of the the the, the malfunctioning of hospitals and in, in a lot in a lot of key areas. 
what does this tell us? I mean, the, from from all indications, the airstrikes uh, in certain areas haven't necessarily uh, reduced. Um, the, there is the, the, there is a shift in, in military tactics, but there are still buildings being bombed, and there are still reports of families uh, reporting their loved ones missing. Is it, the last couple of months? I think maybe the last two months in particular, we've seen a very uh, drastic. Uh, reduction in that death rate. If you were mapping it from the very beginning, there was a period of time in the first couple of months where it was quite dramatically high. And then now, um, over the last couple of months, it, ha it hasn't increased that much. Is that due to a, 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 you know, a, a different tactic in the fighting that's happening on the ground versus the air? Or is this that we're not seeing an accurate picture anymore of this death toll? My guess is there's some of both of those things going on but I'm speculating. I have not been working on the ground in Gaza. So, mm -hmm. but I can tell you that when the Americans invaded Iraq, they had a program that was shockingly called shock and awe. And they dropped about 50,000 bombs in the first couple of months of their occupation. When we did our death toll estimate uh, in 18 months into the conflict, very, very, very disproportionately, those bomb deaths had happened in the beginning. And when you then look two years later at the death toll, killings by the Americans and their allies in 2005, six, seven went way, way down and their killings with bombs almost disappeared. Essentially, the Americans learned how to not be losing the hearts and minds of the Iraqis by killing civilians recklessly. So it is very normal that we have high rates of violent deaths in the beginning of a siege, and then it goes down as it moves into more of a steady state environment. So this is a, a typical pattern, but I can't tell you what's going on here with regard to are the Israelis getting more clever about not killing civilians? Are civilians getting more sophisticated we have now seen in a couple of towns like Rafa, where the Israelis have given warnings, and maybe the warning process is working better now than it did in Gaza seven months ago. I can't tell you the mechanisms, but it is incredibly consistent that as sieges turn into occupations, that the death tolls go down along this in this pattern. It's a very, very consistent pattern we saw across crisis after crisis. And if I can ask you about the other major, um, I suppose, dark cloud that is that is hovering over Gaza, which is which is these these warnings of famine, uh, of widespread starvation. Just this week, the, the Famine Early Warning Systems Network um, published a report saying that it's likely the famine is already underway in northern Gaza and that, that it could spread. And this is this is something that will not necessarily stop if the, even if the fighting stops tomorrow. What do we uh, understand about the way that famine works? I mean, how do you even define a famine? Uh, and then how does it actually impact people on the ground? A famine means three things. Uh, a high level of food insecurity in households, an acute malnutrition rate of like 30% among children under five, and a death toll four times higher than usual, than the norm. It turns out most of the time in the world, when famine happens, the United Nations probably doesn't declare it because in particular, they don't have an accurate death toll. We don't need a definition of famine to get really, really worked up about the need for food and aid in Gaza today. We have, every time you turn on the BBC or open a newspaper, interviews with Médecins Sans Frontières or others saying, oh my gosh, almost every child I see is acutely malnourished coming into my clinic. Uh, we have some not perfectly representative uh, malnutrition data of children saying that malnutrition has, has gone up just remarkably for such a short period. It is very, very uncommon for famine to arise in just half a year. That's a, a very unusual thing because people have resources generally and are robust and they have stockpiles. And you don't think of, of stockpiles like a a closet full of fine, good food. I mean, people have a a four liter container of cooking oil hidden somewhere, and then they just 
put a lot of oil on their rice when their children aren't getting enough to eat. Like normally they have some mechanism given essentially most people in the North have lost all their assets and their homes. That has disappeared. Given you have so many people talking about eating grass and, and foraging for completely unacceptable nutritional inputs, like the overwhelming evidence is that there is an acute food crisis. Why get caught up in the word famine? Because we're probably not going to get a robust enough, like we can't even get the world to agree on the death toll through December when we might have one of the best Ministry of Health records ever. So how are we ever going to do a survey now when we don't even know where all the people are and and get a representative sample that shows 30% malnutrition. Like that's just not going to happen in this chaos and violent environment. So why don't we just accept the world food program statement and UNICEF statement and every physician I've ever heard talking about God's statement that we've got a food crisis going on and respond. I get very uh, disappointed that people get caught up in this word famine and really want to get to that criteria when most of the time, our planet just doesn't have the sort of uh, risk tolerance and backbone to get out and, and define it, whether that's in northern Mali or uh, northern Nigeria a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's a word. It's a horrible word. People use it too much. I think that's a that's a really salient point, and uh, that the, there is you know the, the the documentation of of malnutrition and lack of access to basic necessities is really the the, the crux of the issue, as opposed to whether it passes a threshold or or doesn't. And um, what does that mean? Uh, I mean, in real terms, and and you, and you've been on the ground in a lot of other places, and you've seen the impacts of 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 what conflict creates. In, 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 in mass civilian populations. And there has been estimates and there's been warnings from different bodies and, and UN voices that are saying that if we don't stop this, then half a million people in Gaza might die over the next six months. What happens, uh, not today, not next week, but over the course of a couple of months, if an issue, a crisis like this isn't addressed? You can't, you just can't predict. Like, we just can't say, are 10% of the population going to die or are 50% going to die? We can't say, we can just say it is already a catastrophe. It is on a trajectory to get worse given how poor we are at getting uh, things in uh, supplies, both food and medical into Gaza at this point in time. So uh, yeah, I, I, I get a little impatient with people wanting to know, is it going to be half a million dead or 300,000 dead when, A, if the borders opened up with Egypt tomorrow and 400 trucks per day started coming in rather than the trickling we're having, that would be a completely different experience than if we continue on the road we're on right now. So, like, I think needing a death toll number predicted is it's a really sad commentary on our inability to be compassionate around the world. And, you know, I I, uh, I spent a lot of time working in the Central African Republic and a, a couple years ago, mostly because of what Wagner mercenaries had been doing. Uh, a, a local Congolese NGO recorded really robustly. It was peer reviewed, the highest death toll any country's experienced for 30 years. And the next year, food aid went down to the Central African Republic because no one cares. Here in Gaza, we care, but oh my gosh, what a really sad commentary that we can say we care. We are eight months in and we can't get food into Gaza still. That's that's a shocking level of lack of political will. So there's lack of political will in South Sudan and Sudan and, and the Central African Republic where other kinds of crises are unfolding. But that political will is about, uh, we've got other things to worry about and our budgets are too small. In Gaza, the lack of political will is related to us being just so divisive and torn up that that we can't we can't achieve just minimal things like adequate food supply in a very discreet 
easy to serve area, geographically speaking. And to your point, uh, and, and talking about Sudan, because this is a, uh, a, a civil conflict that is ongoing as we're speaking. It has been ongoing for the last for, for, for the last two years, and and it is experiencing a level of uh, of of you know humanitarian crisis on the ground that I think it was the UN humanitarian chief Martin Griffiths said it was it was the worst that he had ever seen. What is happening there from from what you understand? How, like, is it? I mean, is is it even worth having comparisons or not? Or, or, or or you know, is there is there a way of of kind of uh, holding ourselves accountable to to what we pay attention to and what we don't? So first of all, you know, I don't want to get into the details in South Sudan and Sudan itself because I'm just too ignorant. And I'm getting it all from my former students. Um, but just it's it just breaks my heart that we're having this conversation at all. You know, the the median income in the world is about in the ballpark of six thousand euros per year. And here there are all these people in my country, average worker making six times the global average. And then there are these other places that are making 1% of that in Sudan, in South Sudan, in the Central African Republic. And it is a really just shockingly bizarre thing that we can't trigger the compassion it would take to feed starving children. And uh, this is a bit of a tangent, but it's quite centrally related to Gaza. And I'm quite convinced that the core reason for our lack of compassion in the world is this weird, weird, relatively new, maybe two or three hundred year old concept of nationality. Like, imagine it. If a child is starving next to any American's household, the next house over children are starving, people would never forgive themselves for not feeding that child. We, we understand why we protect our families and we'll feed our families first, but we have a, a, a lot of willingness to feed our neighbors. But once you put up that thing that says, oh, that's not my country, then all of that disappears. Like all of the compassion that you think of with uh, Buddhism or Islam or Christianity that's supposed to be making us serve others. Somehow we've like trained ourselves to think, well, my country comes first, or uh, that's not really my responsibility. And in a sort of depressing way, given that I think inequity is the greatest threat to our species and that nationality is the main structure causing it, like Gaza is making us think about what does nationality mean in a really intense way. And I think it's not openly said. I think it is not what we're discussing. But I am I am encouraged that all these angry students who are worked up about Gaza but couldn't care about South Sudan or the Central African Republic are doing so because their European country or the United States or whoever has been giving money to the Israeli military, has been fueling this weird thing where for more than half a century, people essentially weren't entitled to nationality. And I, I'm happy that Gaza is bringing this to the fore and making us think about, wow, under what conditions do I owe a starving child some food? And under what conditions don't I? And in this particular case, I think everyone feels, oh my gosh, I owe the children of Gaza food. Like, I think most every European, every American has, not every, the vast majority have a sense of that. And when they hear people in the Israeli cabinet saying really inflammatory things like, well, these people need to leave this territory, like, oh my gosh, that's just like so shocking. And the notion that this, that could be said about these people essentially because they don't have the gift of nationality, but the same words could never be used about Egyptians because they do have nationality. That is allowing us to, I think, grapple with this, this notion a little more than I've ever seen before. So I don't want to say I'm hopeful because it's really heartbreaking, but um, I do think there is an opportunity here for us to think about what is the role of humans not being entitled to this concept of nationality when nationality is at the core of what makes us care and take care of others. Two decades ago now, you you made a decision 
to get yourself into Iraq in the middle of a war that your government was was kind of taking the lead on. Um, and I want to ask you, you know, how you got there because it wasn't necessarily through the U.S. military that you were able to access it um, and, and what you saw when you when you entered. So first of all, uh, how I got there, the main thing was I married the right person. And that sounds like a joke, but it's not. Um, I expected to die when I snuck into Iraq. My wife expected to die, but somehow she knew me well enough to know that I would feel so guilty if I didn't when my government was doing this incredible wrong. And so a, a colleague that I had worked with before had an extra like 20 something thousand dollars squirreled away that was sort of unrestricted in his pot for income, Gilbert Burnham at Johns Hopkins. And so I took like $10,000 in cash and I flew to Jordan and I just negotiated to get someone to smuggle me in to Iraq because uh, I had at that point worked in many war zones, Rwanda during the genocide, a really vicious war in Congo, in Bosnia. And all I heard about on the news was about bombs and guns and people dying from that. And every war I had been in, with the possible exception of Bosnia, more people died of the secondary things than of the primary act of violence in times of war. And I heard nothing about that Uh in the press. And I went, uh, having been introduced uh, to someone, uh, to a professor in Baghdad, I went to do a careful survey, thinking I was measuring all those nonviolent deaths that rise in a time of conflict like this. And I, I found a former military officer who every week drove a car out to Jordan and back, and he smuggled me in. Uh, he got to the border. He took my passport. He went in to immigration, having me hide in the back of the car. And his immigration buddy inside told him, you are freaking insane. You are going to get killed for sneaking an American in. And so when he came back, he was so bummed out and so scared. And uh, uh, I, it was just amazing luck that wow. allowed me to be smuggled in. I and my Iraqi colleague did a nationwide survey. I can't believe it. We picked 33 random places and 2004 in the middle of the war, somehow these amazing doctors managed to get everywhere. They had a story that the death toll was twice as high as it had been. And there was a lot of violence, but there actually was more car accidents and other things like I had expected. I just didn't expect it to be all bombs. I think when you do a survey like this, you understand pain much, much more than you ever can listening to the news. Trivial example. One of the interviewers came back and he was he's an MD. He was like 50 years old and he was really shaken. He was really upset because he said two children had died during a period of American bombing and they had died of fright, hugging each other on their bed. And it turns out I had experienced this twice before. Two children with each other at a time of violence, dying of fright. And I think that we just can't understand what war means to children when you're listening on the news to sort of secondhand summaries and to see this doctor in his own culture seeing what I had seen twice before in Africa, children dying of fright, because when they're together in a group, somehow their energy can sort of feed itself. And in this case, they died with their arms around each other on their bed as my country was bombing them. Wow, that, that gives one just the tiniest insight into what a hellacious experience all those children in Gaza are going through now. And the notion that children can die of fright is something that most of us can't even imagine. And so um, it was a, a wonderful experience in a way to sneak into Iraq. The world 
accepted the study, accepting the United States. It was completely rejected when the study came out. I had almost no press interviews. Um, and that that sort of brings us back around to Gaza. Gaza is hyper-political now. I did a really intense study with this Congolese NGO in 2002, published a year ago. When that UN report came out uh, down, that was cited as as estimating fewer deaths and more males than the, than the official death toll had been before. When that came out in Gaza three or four weeks ago, I had more press inquiries than I've had in the last 10 years about the Central African Republic in the week after that happened. So this is somehow hyper-political. It's hyper-political, I think, because of the history and because Palestinians have experienced a lack of statehood for so long and all the oppression and, and inequity that comes with that. But... Uh, wow, the world is is uh, worked up about this. They care about death tolls more than they care about almost anything else in terms of being motivated. So it shouldn't surprise us. It's so it's so politicized. But my friends who have been making estimates at the London School of Hygiene at Johns Hopkins get so many threats, so many hostile emails. It is really disturbing to see them getting what I expected when I estimated 100,000, when our team estimated 100,000 violent deaths in Iraq in 2004, and I came home and had death threats in my mailbox and all this stuff. I expected that. My country was worked up, was pro-war at the time. Wow. I don't quite understand how that happens with Gaza when it's such a small fraction of Europe, such a small fraction of Americans who are at this point pro-Israel with regard to this conflict. It's a really weird dynamic. Thank you for explaining that and, and, and kind of going into the vivid detail that you did because I think it, it is really important because it, 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 it colors your point about the need to, to take uh, an interest, a, a human interest in, in something that is happening and something tragic that is happening, uh, even if it goes outside of your borders, as you, as, as you mentioned before, and, and something that isn't happening to your people, quote unquote, that there is still a, a sense of responsibility. Um, and, and my final question to you, and you know, I, I don't want to, um, I want to press as gently as possible I, I, against your, your point about the, uh, about the death tolls and, and, and kind of what the, the, the real kind of use of them are. For you and your work, when you went to Iraq, when you were able to put out that first report and then a second and, 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 and more of those studies to try and capture what the death toll in Iraq could be, what did you think that made a difference in the way that people in your country, but also around the world, saw what was happening there and saw what the use or the, uh, the, the purpose of a, of, a, of a military operation like that could be? When that 2004 study came out and I gave, I don't know, like 30 talks in the next year going around the country uh, giving them, I thought it wasn't having any effect at all. I was really upset. I have learned since that it seems that study dramatically terminated the, uh, terminated, uh, reduced the amount of aerial weaponry the American military used. So I could have never imagined it in 2004, but it seems that the US military was the main audience in my country for that mm -hmm. study. They're the ones who read it, who believed it, and who used it. And I didn't understand that till a year or two later. And um, I could have never predicted it at the time. In this case, what do we need in Gaza? Well, we have, it's probably getting cruder and cruder. We have a death estimate. And you know what? Maybe it's really 50,000. I don't know. But would 36,000 and 50,000 mean anything different in terms of our internal compassion or our collective political response? I hope not. So uh, I think, I think the death toll is having more effect than we know in that it is the primary thing making so many young people protest at universities. It is the primary thing that is for the average voter in the upcoming election, making people unhappy 
with Joe Biden and how his sort of, so it's had an effect. I don't think we'll understand the effect until we're a little bit further down the road looking back. I think uh, having such a high death toll and such a low functioning logistic supply for food and medicines is going to induce a lot of introspection within the United Nations and the relief community, because this is a, a supply failure of a kind we have not seen in a long, long time. This happened in Biafra. Yeah, but half the population died there. And we felt a lot of shame afterwards. And Médecins Sans Frontières was formed afterwards because we did so badly in Biafra. So uh, when things go badly, sometimes later on, you can't understand uh, that good came of it, good that was invisible to you at the time. Finally, Dr. Roberts, uh, I, I want to ask you, you are a health professional who has spent a long time working in the field in a lot of places. Um, so much of our conversation and so much of what we understand about Gaza rests on the shoulders of the work of health professionals in Gaza um, that have been working tirelessly over the last eight months. That is tremendous work and it is essential work. And, and I just want to ask, you know, health professional to health professional, how do you feel about that kind of work and what it's meant for the world? You see, you are right. When you're listening to the news, health professionals probably are the people that can describe what's happening in a way that stirs people the most. That's really encouraging. But I, I'm mostly actually just worried about the health professionals there. I came back from the Rwandan genocide. I was only out in the field four or five months and I was depressed for like a year. I gained 40 pounds in three months. I had terrible nightmares. Like I'm just scared for them. And, and, and I mean, what is, what is the message that you, that you hope people take out of this? You know, not, not necessarily a, a kind of a grand universal one, but a very immediate one about what we should be paying attention to, what we should be thinking and doing and, and, and acting. So thought number one is that in Gaza, we've got a really robust base that tells us, you know, there's 30 something thousand dead almost for sure. There is like more or less 0% chance that it's fabricated, that the death toll is less than 30,000. Like, so that's thought number one. And thought number two is we don't really need to know any more details than that to understand how untenable this is and the war needs to end. And if the war is not ending, wow, what's our role in all those mechanisms like our national governments personally and their positions like the United Nations that are so dysfunctional at this moment in time. And hey, let's fix them. Les Roberts, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. All right. Thanks for what you do. Thank you for watching this episode of The Big Picture and a big thank you to Les Roberts for being our guest today. We want to know what you have to say about this conversation. So please leave your thoughts in the comments below. As always, you can hear all of our episodes in audio format wherever you get your podcasts from. And until next time, salam.